Um, this is a fascinating story. Uh, it was uh, classified, the mission, Operation Halyard, was classified uh, for over 50 years. Um, it was declassified in 1997, and um, it really was still unknown, you know, to the public at large until George Freeman, or sorry, Gregory Freeman wrote this book, The Forgotten 500. Uh, I read this book um, last year. You recall I gave a talk about my uncle who was a pilot in the 15th Army Air Corps. And um, uh, in that process, of course, I read everything I could lay my hands on about the 15th. And as you recall, the 15th flew missions over the Adriatic Sea, the mountains of Yugoslavia, bombing the Pelestia oil fields in Romania, and then, you know, the German uh, factories in Germany and Austria and Czechoslovakia, rail yards. And, of course, a lot of those guys got shot down. And so they ended up in the Yugoslavia. So this story tonight is about Operation Halyard, which is this incredible rescue of 512 Allied airmen from behind enemy lines in Yugoslavia, something that really nobody knew about until the late 90s when it was declassified. And it, 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 it's such an incredible story, I really can't t give it justice completely. Uh, because you have rescue, which is amazing in and of itself, 500 uh, men from behind enemy lines. Uh, you're gonna hear about betrayal. Um, there's a incredible aspect of this that uh, Russian spies in the British uh, military um, uh, intelligence service uh, actually um, almost derailed the mission itself and certainly led to the demise of our greatest ally in the mission, um, uh, Dra Draza Mihailovic, uh, the leader of the Serbian um, um, Chetniks you'll hear about. Uh, heroism certainly in the rescue itself and General Mihailovic and his Chetnik uh, forces are cer were certainly heroic as were the people uh, who uh, protected our guys while they were um, hiding from the, the, the Germans. And then finally tragedy in what ends up happening to uh, Mr. Uh, General Mihailovic. So this um, 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 emblem on the right hand of the slide that you see there is a wonderful emblem that was just put together this past year, 2017. Uh, they're going to honor uh, General Mihailovic uh, in uh, Yugoslavia, finally. And um, uh, this is the um, uh, emblem they put together for that. And you see in the center of the emblem, the C-47s. Those are the aircraft that were used to rescue our guys from uh, Yugoslavia. Pranjani is the name of the little community where they built by hand this airfield for the C-47s uh, to um, pick up the fellows from. And 1944, of course, is the year in which it occurred. Now, you're gonna hear about two other folks that I've talked about before who are my relatives. You know, I, I started this mission at this meeting to get you all to talk about your own experiences or the experiences of your loved ones. And my first talk was about my dad, uh, who was uh, served with Pan American Airways in Africa. And incredibly, there's a connection to my dad in this story, which I didn't know when I started this process. And then last uh, talk I gave was about my uncle, William Clark, who was a pilot in uh, the 15th Army Air Corps, which I mentioned flew over uh, the areas where these guys were, and undoubtedly knew uh, many of these men who had been shot down and who ultimately became rescued because his time serving there in uh, Foggia Air Force Base in uh, Italy coincided with when these guys were shot down and when they were rescued. So as I mentioned, what do they have in common with Operation Halyard? Well, the Pan Am connection you're gonna hear about in the talk, and then uh, most of the Americans who were uh, rescued were 15th Army Air Corps um, um, airmen. So let's put, set the stage a little bit. So where Europe 1942, of course, was the greatest extent of the Nazi occupation of Europe, and uh, this you know, very general map sets the stage for us in 1942. As you can see, nearly everything is occupied by the Germans in, in Central 
uh, Europe, only um, independent, quasi-independent Spain and, and Russia, which was under invasion at the time, uh, and Great Britain were free. And then in, by 1944, we had uh, taken the southern part of Italy, and that's where our two main bases were at Bari, in, in, uh, in way down in the boot, and then in Foggia, slightly north um, of there. And so our guys, you'll see in this next not very good map, were flying missions from southern Italy, this is from Foggia, I think, mostly, to Palesti over in uh, Romania, uh, to sites in uh, the Balkans here, and then mainly during this time up in Czechoslovakia, Austria, Germany, and then some in support of our attacks in northern uh, Italy. So you can see what's there between Yugoslavia. So planes that are hit in here, you know, they're going to be coming back and those guys are going to jump out over Yugoslavia. So the three main characters in this story are these three men shown on this slide. This is General Draza Mihailovic, uh, who was the Chetnik general, and the Chetniks were the royalists. So uh, Yugoslavia was a kingdom uh, when uh, World War II broke out, and when the Nazis uh, took uh, Yugoslavia by force uh, and ran off uh, the royal family, uh, a large chunk of the population were more conservative, mainly the Serbians, and they wanted to keep the, uh, the, the royal um, tradition in Yugoslavia. And he was the leader of that group, the Chetniks. Uh, George Voinovich is shown here in the upper right-hand corner of the slide, and he is an American born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania of Serbian parents. He, when he became old enough to go to college, he got a scholarship through the Serbian National um, University in Belgrade. So he came to Belgrade, went to Belgrade, uh, the capital of uh, Yugoslavia, uh, to attend university as an American. So he's an American in, in, in Yugoslavia when World War II breaks out. And then in the bottom right-hand corner is um, Art Jabilian. Uh, who was an OSS officer who actually dropped in to the uh, Yugoslavia and he coordinated with, with uh, Voinovich uh, the rescue of our guys from behind enemy lines along with a couple of other guys. Now the reason I've put Jabilian here is because in 2011 he gave this incredible interview uh, that I found on YouTube and so you're going to see and hear Art Jabilian telling about his experiences in Yugoslavia in 1944 uh, uh, live and in, in color. So. So uh, I, I focus mainly on Voinovich, although it's hard to, to keep all the players together because, well, first of all, he's going to intersect with my dad during the part of this story, so that, that makes it interesting to me. But it's also a really incredible story. So um, Voinovich goes to Belgrade, like I said, to go to university. He meets uh, Mariana, and it's a really wonderful uh, story of their courtship. and and coming together uh, right as the war is breaking out there in Yugoslavia. Um, and Mirjana is not a mere passive character in this story. As you'll see, she plays a, a central role in, in encouraging George to uh, save these Americans. So Belgrade's overrun by the Germans in April of 1941, and uh, they did not uh, meekly submit. Um, uh, the Germans, you know, are pushing into Eastern Europe to uh, be prepared to invade Russia. They knew that. Uh, the Russians had their head in the sand, but um, that's what was going on, and they uh, didn't want to have a lot of uh, fighting going on in the, in, the, in the meantime, so they decided to make an example out of Belgrade, and they called it, and I, I originally had the German in the slide, but you know, I took three years of German in college, and I still butcher it, so you get the uh, English version, uh, Operation Retribution. And uh, so Hitler made an example of Belgrade and dropped uh, 760 tons of bombs on the city in one day. Up until that point, uh, uh, Voinovich and Mariana hoped to stay. Her family was there, and um, uh, he loved it there. And, uh, but boy, when he saw those bombs coming in, the destruction of the city, he knew they had to get out. 
So they were trying to find how, how they could get out. And they uh, ended up uh, going to um, uh, Budapest in an attempt to get out through Hungary. Uh, but that didn't work. Uh, but they learned while they were in Hungary they might possibly be able to fly out, uh, fly from Hungary to Bulgaria. The problem was the flight went from, Bulga from Hungary, Budapest, to Belgrade to Bulgaria. So they had to go back through Belgrade to get out. So Voinovich and Mariana marry. Voinovich is an American citizen, so he has an American passport, but Mariana does not. She's a, a Yugoslav. She's married an American. They go to the consulate. The consulate gives her a paper that says, you're married to an American, but that's all it says. It's not a passport. So they get on this plane from Budapest to Bulgaria, going through Belgrade, and they are separated. They are the last two people to get on the plane. And Mariana sits down beside none other than Magda Goebbels, the wife of Joseph Goebbels, head of the Luftwaffe and the chief propagandist of the Nazi war machine. She knew who she was and she was terrified. So she'd never flown before. On top of being terrified by sitting beside Magda Goebbels, she gets airsick. So uh, Mrs. Goebbels starts taking care of this young woman who's getting sick beside her in the airplane, is feeling sorry for her. George goes up, sees his wife is uh, ill. She whispers in his ear, do you see who's beside me? <laughs> They're both terrified. So they land in Belgrade. Remember, she has no passport. And so the German officials, because Germany has now occupied Belgrade, refused to let her off the plane, refused to let her into the, the airport there in Belgrade. So up steps Magda Goebbels, barks at the German officials, what do you mean, passport? Can't you see she's standing there with her husband? He's standing there right next to you. Look, she's sick. Help this woman or you will hear it from me. So, so Magda Goebbels, the wife of Joseph Goebbels, facilitates Voinovich and his wife escaping from Nazi German occupied Eastern Europe. <laughs> Just blows my mind. So they make it from there, from uh, Bulgaria. It takes them about a year, but they end up in Cairo. And in Cairo, they meet a fellow named George Krager, and we're going to hear about him a little later, too. George Krager was the head of Pan American Airways Africa Limited in uh, Africa at the time. So he was my father's boss, and he becomes Voinovich's boss. He hires Voinovich, and Voinovich becomes the head of station for Accra. Accra is in what was then known as the Gold Coast, is now known as Ghana. And if coming from west to east, which is the way the flights would come, um, uh, bringing in material from America, uh, his, his stop off at Accra was the last one before they got to Maduguri, where my dad was. So there's no question that my dad and this fellow knew each other. They were the two heads of station of the two stations you know, adjacent to each other on the Takarati route which uh, I didn't know, of course, when I started looking into all this. All right, so what about Mariana? Well, she goes on to America, and she goes to work at the Yugoslavian embassy, which, of course, was a Yugoslavian embassy in exile. Uh, the the, 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 the Nazi-dominated government, you know, didn't, wasn't involved. It was the royalist government still there. And she starts hearing about these stories of American airmen being held and protected by uh, Yugoslav uh, folks in Yugoslavia. And uh, they're getting, you know, telegrams and messages, and they're passing them along to the State Department and passing them along to U.S. military officials. And it doesn't seem like anything's happening. They don't understand why. So she starts pestering her husband about it. And lo and behold, he's recruited by the OSS to go work for the OSS, which is now known as the CIA. And they, because of his Serbian language uh, you know, expertise, assign him to, uh, head of to be head of station for the OSS in Bari, Italy, home of the 15th Army Air Corps. So there, 
with this knowledge of, of the that his wife's been telling him, there are these Americans, you know, being protected behind enemy lines by our our, our native peoples in Yugoslavia. He starts really pushing to investigate that. A little bit of background about the people on the ground in Yugoslavia. I mentioned Draza Mihailovic, the Serbian general. He was the leader. And during the whole course of this story, he risked the life, his life and the lives of his men and the civilians under his protection to rescue over 500 airmen. Originally, he was supported by the British. He was seen as a great, um, um, you know, fighter against Hitler initially. Uh, and in fact, in 1942, I think it was 1942, he was the man of the year in Time Magazine. He's featured on the cover of Time Magazine as the man of the year. But unbeknownst to anyone there at the time, these Russian spies in the British Secret Service, or British, actually it's the British Military Intelligence Service, their mission is to convince the Allies to not support Mihailovich because he's a royalist, but instead to support Tito, the communist leader. And so they start these stories and these tales of Mihailovich being a collaborator. Now, indeed, Mihailovich did from time to time work with Nazi occupied regions uh, because he was protecting the civilians, remember? And so it's kind of like, you know, you have, you have these civilians under your control, they have these civilians under their control, you've got the hospital, I've got the farms, you know. So he did interact with the Germans a little bit, but he fought more battles and led more attacks on German uh, military facilities and, and, than, than, than Tito ever did. And he, uh, as you'll see in a moment, had 57,000 men under his command uh, ready to, to bring into action uh, with the Allies at any time. So this is a picture of he uh, and some of his troops. So the first fellow that uh, Voinovich uh, had flown in for the OSS was this guy here, George Mazulin. Mazulin's an interesting guy. He played professional football in Pittsburgh for the pre- cursor of the Pittsburgh Steelers. I can't remember the name of the team. It wasn't called the Steelers, but uh, it, it was a professional football player, a lineman, and some OSS guys heard him talking and realized he, you know, was fluent in uh, Serbian. So they recruited him to be in the OSS. So he drops in by himself in uh, October of 1943 on a mission to see, well, what's this Mihailovic guy really like? Is he a collaborator or is he somebody we can trust? And then we hear these tales of him having U.S. airmen under his protection. Is that true? We've heard he maybe have 20 or 30, something like that. Is that true? So, so Mazulin drops in in a parachute, hangs out with the Chetniks for several months, reports back to HQ, yes, this Mihailovich guy is the real McCoy. He is very anti-German. I have been on missions. I have witnessed attacks that his troops have made on German facilities. Uh, and he's got 57,000 troops under his command. It's not a small, you know, uh, insurgency. And then you're not gonna believe how many airmen he's got under his protection. At the time of his, this report, he had 250 not 25 like they thought, but 250. And of course, over the next year, we learn he had over 500 under his protection. In German occupied territory in Yugoslavia, the airplanes were shot down. They couldn't go on anymore. They parachuted or landed in Yugoslavia. And there they were, for the most part, found by the Chetniks. And the Chetniks, uh, guarded uh, and protected and fed uh, these uh, airmen uh, for quite a few months uh, and took care of them partly because they were allies and partly because of the fact that there's a tradition, Serbian tradition of hospitality. And also in much of the rest of Yugoslavia, there's a Serbian saying, can I say in Serbian? Uh, dobro, do, let me see, dobro, dobro došli, naši gosti, vama meso nama kosti, which means welcome our guests, you can eat the meat, we'll eat the bones. As a member of the CIA, or OSS really at the time, 
I volunteered to go into Yugoslavia on what a mission that was called a Halyard mission. This was to uh, evacuate 50 airmen, American airmen, who had been shot down and were now being harbored in an area called Pranjani. We finally made it into Pranjani on August the 2nd, 1944. And we found not 50 American airmen, but 250 American airmen. They had been sheltered there and protected by General Mihailovic. The Serbian people, and I cannot say enough about them now, had also sheltered them and protected them against the Germans, and they fed them uh, out of their own rations that they really couldn't afford to do. Because you must remember that the Serbs had been raped by the Germans, ravaged by a civil war, and they didn't have two nickels to rub together. But as poor as they were, and as much as they lacked for their own personal well-being, they still shared with our Americans. And if they were wounded, they gave their bed up to the Americans. And I get a little emotional sometimes when I talk about them. But they slept on the floor while our American boys slept in their beds. They fed them food that they needed for their own family so that our boys would be fed. I want to emphasize that we as a nation owe the Serbian people. And we cannot say that about very many nations. Most of the nations in this world owe us. But we owe the Serbs because they took care of our boys in a manner that no one else could have done. So what's going on in Yugoslavia is not just this war against the, the German invaders, but you've got, a, you've got a civil war going on between the Chetniks uh, and the partisans who are uh, supported by the Russians. And the, as I mentioned, the Chetniks are trying to, uh, they're the royalists, and the partisans are supported by the Soviets. They want a Soviet-style uh, People's Republic. And the leader of the partisans, probably all of us know of, uh, Joseph uh, Tito, because he won. <laughs> uh, and he won because, well, you're going to hear, uh, we got to let him win. Uh, so he was supported by the Soviet Union, and uh, he led the partisans, and he opposed Mihailovic uh, with much more uh, combative force uh, than he did the Nazis. Now, maybe I'm being too hard on Tito. Part of, the, part of it was geography. The, the partisans were in the north, which was much closer to the German uh, controlled areas, and the partisans, the Chetniks were in the north, and the partisans were in the south. So they were a little bit further away, and maybe that's why Tito's um, number of engagements against the Germans were not as n numerous as Mihailovic. But anyway, you look at it. Um, uh, now, what we didn't know, what the Americans didn't know during the war, the British didn't know during the war, and we really didn't know until the 1980s, if you can believe it, was that the partisans had helped, the communists had helped behind the allies' lines, so behind our lines. This guy in Bari, Italy, was with the uh, Royal Army. He was their SOE agent, so their military intelligence agent in Bari, James Klugman, and he was a Russian spy. His primary objective was to help the allies uh, to keep the Allies from helping Mihailovic. So if they didn't help Mihailovic, then that would facilitate Tito succeeding. And he succeeded. Mihailovic succeeded. The British were so convinced that Mihailovic was a Nazi collaborator that they ultimately stopped helping him altogether. And during the course of Operation Halyard, they were forbidden to take anything to the Chetniks, anything to Mihailovic's forces to help them at all, um, which is incredibly strange because right they're helping us, you know, <laughs> rescue 500 or so of our men, but yet we're not allowed to help. This was a, a man called James Klugman, uh, who uh, constantly gave information which was anti-Chetnik and praising uh, the partisans as being the real fighters, while well, the Chetniks were all on the side of the Germans. And he was giving information that the Chetniks were actually uh, capturing airmen and cutting off their ears and turning them over to the Germans, which wasn't true at all, which is a total lie. It wasn't uh, widely known uh, that Klugman and a number of his associates were really secret agents for Joseph Stalin and uh, communism.
until in the 1980s. Then they started discovering uh, more information about it, and they found out there were there was a whole network of Soviet spies in the British intelligence apparatus uh, who were deceiving uh, the British government uh, in the, on the behalf of the Soviet government or Russia. And uh, one of the ways that this was known was after the fall of the Soviet Union, a lot of uh, the Soviet archives were opened and the former KGB information, a number of uh, the former KGB people started telling everybody of what was going on. Documentation was made available. This was a really very major spy ring, a misinformation ring, doing whatever they can to help the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union was considered by the communists around the world as uh, the highest development of society in human history. Unfortunately, Klugman happened to be a mole, a communist mole that uh, uh, interviewed Tito. Tito whined and dined him. Klugman was also an alcoholic. And Tito sold him a bill of goods. Klugman never bothered to go to see Tito or Mihailovich. He just stayed with Tito. He didn't get Mihailovich's side of the story. He went back to uh, Churchill, and there's another fellow by the name of Deacon, who was also a mole for the Russians. He was in the uh, um, uh, British Secret Service, and he reported to Deacon also. And Deacon and Klugman went to, to um, uh, Churchill, and they said, oh, Tito's doing a wonderful job. He's fighting the Germans. Mihailovich isn't doing anything. He's collaborating with them. And they sold Churchill a bill of goods. And Churchill decided, okay, since that was the story, he would um, uh, back, t uh, back Tito. And he had to get, um, Stalin, of course, was thrilled. Uh, Roosevelt was a sick man, and he went along. They had put enough pressure on him. He went along with it. So the decision was made to back Tito and not Mihailovich. And that is why the British did not want Mihailovich uh, to get credit for rescuing uh, the airmen. Because if, they, if he rescued airmen, how could he be a collaborator? It didn't, it didn't make sense, you know? Hell, if he were a traitor, we had, he had three OSS personnel, Jabilian, uh, Muslin, and Ryasic, he could turn them over to the Germans who would have been tickled pink to have them. All right, so uh, this is a picture again of uh, George Voinovich, and uh, he pressed ahead despite Klugman's efforts to, you know, uh, depress the willingness to uh, believe in Mihailovich and instead support um, Tito. He said, look, I don't care whether Mihailovich is a collaborator or not, let's get these airmen out of there. Mihailovich says he's willing to help us, let's take advantage of that. So Voinovich pushed ahead in his role as the OSS a leader in, uh, in Bari, Italy, uh, to try to rescue these downed airmen. And um, uh, Mussolini was on the first four flights. Uh, the British were given the, the command of the aircraft uh, to run the first four missions, and Mussolini went on those missions. Well, it just so happened that every time, the first two times, the British landed in partisan territory and dropped off supplies for the partisans. So Mussolini's outraged. You know, we're supposed to be over here in Pragnani picking up American airmen, and you're down here in the south dropping off supplies for Tito. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. So then the next two times, you know, he's not, a, he's not a, a navigator, but he knew when the plane took off from the air, airport and it went north and it didn't go east, that the British pilots were pulling a fast one on him. So he raised, he's a big man and, you know, he's a loud guy. He raises immortal hell. And the British had him removed. So Mussolini gets out of the picture. They, they can't tolerate him anymore. But um, Voinovich convinces the Americans, look, we still got to try to rescue these guys. They get American pilots involved, and that's when Jabilian and Lalich are become the OSS men on the ground in Yugoslavia, uh, and Mussolini is out. Certain American intelligence officers of the OSS, 
especially uh, Voinovich. George Voinovich uh, apparently was told by his wife as a result of information received from the American Serbian community that uh, there were hundreds of downs of pilots and airmen in Chetnik hands and that nothing was being done for them. So he started organizing and pushing for rescue attempt and after a while uh, he managed to actually get the approval of the White House for a rescue with him. Yes, Vojnovich was born in America of Serbian parents, and his wife was actually uh, born in Serbia, a Serbian woman who had uh, been taken by Vojnovich to America as well. They married, and she was uh, working in Washington, D.C., actually, and she was in contact with uh, parts of the Yugoslavian diplomatic staff and government in exile people who happened to be in Washington, D.C. And they actually told her that uh, uh, Draja Mihalovic is asking for an allied rescue of these flyers, repeatedly asking. Mihalovic was sending messages to the Serbian government in exile, uh, especially the U.S. Ambassador Fortich in Washington, D.C., uh, that there should be some kind of rescue, and nothing was happening. So she told her husband, and her husband actually who was able to confirm uh, what his wife told him because he was in southern Italy, and he was an OSS officer in the military, and uh, he managed uh, to uh, use uh, his connections and influence to get uh, approval on the highest level for a rescue attempt, including approval from uh, President uh, Roosevelt himself, and also approval for, from uh, one of the leading Air Force General, General Nathan Twining, that there should The story of Operation Halyard, the rescue of 512 Allied airmen trapped behind enemy lines, is one of the greatest rescue and escape stories ever. But almost no one has heard about it. And that is by design. The American, British, and Yugoslav governments hid details of this story for decades, purposefully denying credit to the heroic rescuers and the foreign ally who gave his life to help Allied airmen as they were hunted down by Nazis in the hills of Yugoslavia. Operation Halyard was the largest rescue ever of downed American airmen and one of the largest such operations in the Second World War or since. Hundreds of American airmen were rescued, along with some from other countries, right under the noses of the Germans, and mostly in broad daylight. The mission was a complete success, the kind that should have been trumpeted in newsreels and published on the front page of the newspapers, but it wasn't. It is a little-known episode that started with one edge-of-your-seat rescue in August of 1944, followed by a series of additional rescues over several months. American agents from the OSS, the precursor of the CIA, worked with a Serbian guerrilla, General Draja Mihailovic, to carry out the huge, ultra-secret rescue mission. This is the story of young airmen shot down in the hills of Yugoslavia during bombing runs and the four secret agents who conducted their amazing rescue. These are the stories of young men, many of them first-generation Americans, the proud, patriotic sons of European immigrants who were eager to join the war and fight the Germans, even finding excitement in the often deadly trips from Italy to bomb the German oil fields in Romania but who found themselves parachuting out of crippled planes and into the arms of strange, rough-looking villagers in a country they knew nothing about. They soon found that the local Serbs were willing to sacrifice their own lives to keep the down airmen out of German hands, but they still wondered if anyone was coming for them or if they would spend the rest of the war hiding from German patrols and barely surviving on goat's milk and bread baked with hay to make it more filling. Gregory A. Freeman. So how did they do it? Well, um, the details, I just, you know, I don't have time to go into everything about it, and, and uh, I highly commend you this book, but 
the um, physical uh, place was at this place called Pranjani, the secret airfield on this map. And amazingly, a German, a large German garrison and airfield was nearby at Kakak. And again, I may not be pronouncing that exactly right. Somebody else says it again later in the video, so we'll get that right. So that not only were the Chetniks, you know, protecting these Americans, but then the 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 really only place they felt like they could build a secret airfield just happened to be in a location that was very close to a, a German garrison. Um, you may know this already, but this part of the world is very similar to our East Tennessee, Western North Carolina. It's mountainous, you know, but not with um, incredibly high mountains, but very often mountains. So very difficult to build an airfield uh, in, in a place like that. And so where they built this airfield at Pranjani uh, was in a high meadow. And uh, they leveled this meadow by hand. I, I, I may, I can't remember if I included pictures of the of the fellas uh, working, but the American airmen helped the villagers themselves. They all worked together to build this uh, uh, a flattened field. Um, so here's a picture of uh, Jabilian and uh, Lalich with the, the downed airmen uh, in Yugoslavia, uh, obviously delighted to be working on this mission. And we've heard about Voinovich and Bari working with them to help them get out. They're going to use C-47s to fly into that little man-made airport and haul these guys out. Now, a C-47 can carry more than 20 men at a time, but uh, Voinovich decided and the, the men on the ground with the OSS agreed that they should only do uh, carry 20 men because the airfield was so short. Uh, they just didn't have the, the time to get up the speed that they would need to carry a normal load. And um, uh, in the harrowing uh, first rescue on the night of August 9, uh, 1944, that, that very point about the weight uh, almost came to a, a horrific end and that the, the nearly crashed, the first uh, plane nearly crashed. Um, so after that first um, uh, few days, uh, the first flight in August, uh, at night in August, uh, ultimately they start doing them during the day. And um, here's a, a color photograph, you can believe it, taken on September 6, 1944, the day of one of the day missions uh, of the rescue attempts. And so the Americans, by this point, um, had air superiority if they put fighters in the air. And of course, up until this point, you would only put fighters up in the air to accompany bombers on bombing missions. Well, Voinovich got with uh, General Twining, and General Twining agreed, yep, let's send up uh, fighters with these C-47s. Then you can run these uh, planes in during the day. The C-47s will go strafe the German air base, keep the Germans occupied, not let them think that, you know, we're doing something else, and it worked. Uh, and so here's uh, Art Jubilean tell us a little bit about that. Uh, we started out on August the 9th, actually, and brought four planes in. But it was a nighttime evacuation, and it was very, very dangerous. Um, and we almost lost a plane, so we decided we, were not, we weren't going to complete it that night, and we do a daylight eva evacuation the next day. In the meantime, we decided there's a German garrison at Chachak, which is about 20 miles away, and we decided we better have uh, some fighter planes and uh, dive bomb and strafe them so they couldn't send a garrison or a, a, a contingent out to, to uh, intercept the planes and, and make us lose some of our pilots and downed airmen. So this is what happened. Uh, the C-47s came in, 14 of them the next day, with a squadron of P-38s and P-51s. The fighter pilots uh, dive-bombed and straight cha-cha. The C-47s came in and landed. We loaded them up and they took off. The fighter planes came back and sort of gave us an aerial show to let us know they were on their way back to escort the, the C-47s back to Italy. And uh, uh, we, got, we, we were very happy to have a, a safe uh, evacuation without losing a man or a plane. So the, uh, the fighter cover uh, for these missions was provided by none other than the uh, now famous uh, Tuskegee Airmen, uh, the African-American pilots who were featured you know, not too long ago in a movie uh, about the red tail uh, pilots. Um, now the American uh, airmen uh, 
they, they, as you can tell from our, listening to Art Jabillion, they, they really felt very grateful uh, to these civilians who had protected them from the Germans and had fed them and, and nursed them back to health in some instances. And, uh, but they didn't know how they could, how they could show their thanks. And so uh, on one of these first missions, I can't remember which one it was, uh, uh, the guys decided, you know what, these people don't have any shoes and we've got these, these boots on, we can get more shoes and we go to Italy, so let's give them our shoes. So they took off their, their boots as they got onto the plane and left them there, you know, for the, the Chetniks who were very grateful. And so these guys, that's why their legs are wrapped up, because they don't have any shoes on. And of course, they're all airmen, so they knew how cold it was going to be on that plane, you know, without having, uh, having uh, foot gear on, but still they, they gave their shoes to the, to the Chetniks as a show of appreciation, which I thought was very touching. So the last flight was on November, I'm sorry, December 27th, 1944. So they started August 9, and they were finished by, by December 27th. And the pilot on the last flight, so this, this plane's gonna pick up the last group of American airmen and the OSS agents, so Lilich and uh, Jabillion. And so for that flight, the pilot is none other than uh, George Krager, that same gentleman you heard about at the beginning of the talk, who was the head of Pan American World Air, uh, uh, Africa Limited in Cairo, who hired Voinovich to work for Pan American. So they're reunited for this final mission where Krager is to fly in and pick up these uh, OSS agents and the last group of American airmen. Well. Voinovich had heard about the, the Americans leaving their boots and, and shoes for the Chetniks and thanks, and so he commandeers secretly, you know, through the, through the PX, I guess, I can't remember how he did it, a plane full of shoes to send to the Chetniks. Now, it's strictly forbidden that we provide Mikhailovich with any assistance. The British have convinced the Americans that he's a collaborator. You're verboten to give them anything. So this was strictly against rules for Voinovich to do this. And Krager knew the rules. And Krager was Voinovich's boss, right, in civilian life and was a captain of this uh, C-47. So he gets on the plane and he says to Voinovich, I can't do this. I'm, I'm not carrying this stuff in there. So Voinovich tells Krager about the boys leaving their shoes, you know, for the, for the villagers and prevails upon him about how much that Mihailovich and his men and, and the civilians had done. So Krager carries the shoes to them mm -hmm. and uh, on that final mission. And this, this is a photograph of Krager and his co-pilot. So as, as was mentioned in the video, incredibly there were no casualties in all these missions. Not one uh, man was uh, injured, not one plane was lost, uh, all 512 uh, were rescued and all the, the flights were carried out without, without you know, anything bad happening to them. Now the Chetniks who provided protection, shelter, food and safe passage, other than the shoes they got from Voinovich and, and that the American boys left for them as they left, got nothing. They got no, no thank you from the American government no uh, note of appreciation from the U.S. military, no support for their efforts against the, the Germans, nothing. In fact, it's quite a bit worse. They completely abandoned Mihailovich, and not too long after December 1944, May of 1945, the Germans fell, and uh, Tito and his gang start a mission of trying to find Mihailovich, who they capture in 1946, and ultimately shoot him to death after a show trial. So here's uh, Art Jabillion uh, talking, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. So our guys, the, the pilots, it's not quite yet, Ed, just a minute. Um, uh, they, of course, learned about this show trial going on and they felt terrible about this happening to Mihailovich and so you're gonna hear Dar Art Jabillion telling about this photograph and other efforts that the, that the pilots put together. Here you go, Ed, thanks, Edward. Arshad Mihailovich. Uh, was uh, after the war on the run for about a year and a half while the Tito's troops uh, tried to find him. They eventually arrested him and he was uh, in June 10th, uh, 1946. He was placed on trial. Uh, the survivors, we have to say the survivors, 
of the rescue attempt, the Americans mostly, organized to help him and uh, did whatever they could all over the country. And they actually got the United States government uh, to request a fair trial for Draja Mihalovic. They wanted to go to his trial and give evidence that he was not a collaborator, that he actually was on the Allies' side and helped the Allies. Uh, the government of Yugoslavia at that time refused to take any of their evidence. And one morning I picked up the Washington Post and on the front page was a little article about Ye Big that said the, fire, the forces of Marshal Tito have captured General Draja Mihailovic. Well, I had been told that I wasn't to discuss this Halyard mission with anyone, but I knew what was in store for Mihailovic. So against orders, I went down to the Washington Post. I asked to see the editor. And I said, sir, th this is my story. And I told him about the Halyard mission. And I concluded my remarks by saying, if he's a traitor and a collaborator, I'm a traitor and a collaborator too. Put me on trial with him. I'm one little guy. I had no political clout. I'm all by myself. And it didn't catch up. Unfor uh, but fortunately, the local newspaper in Toledo, Ohio, where I was raised, picked up the story and did publish it in the Toledo Blade. So there's, there was an article about it in the Toledo Blade. But fortunately for me, these 500 airmen that we had uh, rescued, they kept in touch with one another. And they formed a committee. Uh, and they met in Fort Stevenson in Chicago. And uh, they sent a delegation, there were 20, I think it was 20 or 21 guys, into Washington. And they contacted me also. And we decided we were going to see our congressmen, our representatives, and the State Department. And we were going to do all we could to get ourselves to testify at Mihailovich's trial. Well, we tried. We, got, we contacted our senators and our representatives, and they tried. Uh, the State Department sent several letters to Tito, you know, his government, uh, so they rejected us. Because the ulterior motive we had, if we could just let Mihailovich know that we had not forgotten him, that we still appreciated him, at least he would have that knowledge. He would know that. And we know he was cooped up. We know he was incommunicado. But if he could just learn that we were fighting for him, that we had not forgotten him, this would go so much towards easing his last few moments of his life because we knew it was just a question of time when he would be executed. Perhaps murdered would be a better word rather than executed because that's what he was. So um, they did prevail on President Truman after Mihailovich was executed uh, to award Mihailovich the Legion of Merit. And there's a picture of it right there. But so, so bizarre is that because Tito, as you'll recall, uh-oh, got a problem, sorry. Uh, Tito, as you'll recall, really was more Western than the Soviet Union. We didn't want to upset him. So that's why it was kept secret for all these years. They didn't even tell Mihailovich's family that they'd given him this medal until uh, after the tw in the 21st century. Um, and so this was all done in secret. The award of the medal was in secret. They didn't tell anybody about it. And, uh, uh, you know, you heard the airmen, they spoke out to try to help Mihailovic in the 50s in various newspapers. And then in 1993, a group of them marched in the Desert Storm um, Parade in New York City, carrying this banner uh, highlighting uh, that, that, uh, the, what had happened. In 1995, when we're bombing Serbia as part of the um, uh, effort to try to, you know, resolve or help resolve that civil war that was going on then, or whatever you called it, between the Bosnians and the Serbians and the Herzegovinians and everything, Richard, Richard Feldman, who was one of the 512 airmen who was saved, wrote an impassioned open letter uh, to the Serbian people going into extreme detail about what he'd been through, how much he appreciated it. It's really an incredible letter. And he goes on, he's an active duty U.S. general at the time, 
1995 questioning our participation in the bombing of Serbia, wondering if that is something we shouldn't be doing at the time. So finally in 1997, the files are declassified for Operation Halyard. Uh, we uh, had deferred to the British on that and they finally declassified their files in 1997, so we did too. And then in uh, 2005, these gentlemen, and of course this is uh, Art Jabillion who you've heard from, and that's George Voinovich uh, in the middle, uh, go to see Mihailovich's daughter, and this is the last little excerpt. Well, his father, Draja Mihailovich. 57 years later, in 2005, we, again, a contingent of four or five of us, of the airmen who had been shot down, and myself and George Voinovich, uh, went to uh, uh, Yugoslavia, to Belgrade, and presented the medal to Dr. Gordana Mihailovic uh, in honor of her, her dad. And um, this was a very, very emotional one because I had prepared an L album with some of the pictures that Alan, a photographer, had had given us back uh, in 1945. And I presented it to her. I thought she might appreciate it, and she very much did. One of the highlight moments of my life, uh, Claire Musgrave. And so um, about 10 years, uh, well, I guess about two years after that, when they gave the medal to Mihailovich's daughter, uh, uh, this book was uh, published by uh, Gregory Freeman. And uh, it's a, it goes into the details of the flights and, and that, you know, much more than I have today. But I thought you all would find that an interesting uh, story. It, it has so many different aspects, and I sort of just scratched the surface. But that's it. Thanks.